for it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lower. Uh, today we are continuing in our series. I know there's only one more lesson after this. The 16 tenets of faith of the Assemblies of God, the 16 tenets of faith of the Pentecostal Christian Church. I know we had a break. We had Mother's Day. We had Pentecost Sunday, and we, we looked at other things. But today we're looking at the final judgment. I think it's a very sobering uh, doctrine, but, well, there's some good things in this. So if you have your notes, you'll follow along with me. You also notice, let me, let me just say right now, you'll notice on some of the pages, the printing is a little lighter. And you say, well, what did you do, Pastor? Do you have a problem with the printer? No, that's actually, we're not going to cover that portion. I put it in the notes for your own edification and your own study. And we'll, I'll just briefly go through that quickly, but it's, um, it, it's highlighted uh, in my notes in red. That's why it came out in a lighter color, and it was purposely so that we could di differentiate that which I'm covering and that which I'm letting you go home and take for homework. Everybody doing okay this morning? Amen. Amen. All right. The final judgment. The various judgments referred to in Scripture. I know this is a topic that we don't like to talk about. In many churches today, you'll never hear the topic of judgment. It's all, you know, it's all uh, Twinkies and, and, and ice cream. It's all, you know, positive. It's all, all the happy stuff. And we're all good. I'm good. You're good. We're all happy. And, but friends, judgment is a real thing. Judgment is a real issue. And to ignore it, I would be remiss as a pastor if I didn't preach on this talk, topic, I would be remiss as a pastor if I didn't talk about the judgment of God. It's a real deal. <laughs> Amen? Final judgment's a real deal. There are many judgments referred to in Scripture. God being a just and righteous God, he must judge sin. People say, well, you know, talking about just judgment and why does God have to be so harsh and why is judgment... Well, you know, if, if one of your loved ones was... Injured, if one of your loved ones was, uh, was murdered, um, would you want justice? <laughs> of course you would. Uh, there must be justice in, in, in God's world. He's a just God and he must judge sin. In Hebrews 9, chapter 9, verse 27, the Bible says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. The fact of the matter is, every single one of us, sitting here or listening to this, is one day going to stand in judgment. Now, I'll talk about this a little bit further. It'll make more sense. The psalmist declares in Psalm 89, 14, um, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. God is a God of justice. God is a judge. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 25. Now, uh, Abraham, God said, he, he appears to Abraham, he comes to Abraham in, in uh, the, the pre-incarnate Christ, three angels appear to Abraham, and, and the Lord says, I'm going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah because of their, their sin, because of the sodomy of that nation, of that city. I'm going to judge them. I'm going to rain justice upon them. And Abraham begins to intercede. Abraham begins to pray and say, you know, God, please, if, if there's any righteous there, and he intercedes. And, and this, is what, this is what Abraham says to God. He says, that be, it fa that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Will not... The judge of all the earth do the right thing. He's not going to judge or, or, or condemn everyone. He's going, to, he's going to spare the righteous. Will he not do the right thing? Of course, the answer is yes, he will. God, as a righteous judge, must judge sin. Now, some believe, as I believed when I grew up, 
I was taught, in, and many believe erroneously, that there will be one general day of reckoning on which all beings, just or unjust, will be judged. Was that your understanding, perhaps, growing up? Were you taught there is a day of judgment, and on the day of judgment, everybody is going to come and stand before God, and God is going to separate the good people from the bad people. The good people go to, uh, get to go to heaven, and the bad people go to hell. Was that what you were taught, pretty much? You get this picture, at least in, in our heads, of a one day of judgment when good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. This basically, usually, is based on our goodness or, and on our good works. At least that's how I, was, I came up. There's some scale on our behalf that's balancing our good works against our bad works. And as long as we keep the scale at least balanced or maybe tipped in our favor, we're good. And so the more good works we do, uh, the better off we're going to be on the day of judgment. Sound familiar to you to some degree? Okay, let's, that's not true. It's not what the Bible says, but let's just assume for a second it were true. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with that? How's, your, how's your, your scale tipping? You say, well, I'm a good person. Well, you know, Jesus said that if you think... Uh, an evil thought you're guilty of. If you, if you hate your brother, you're angry with your brother, uh, you're, you're guilty of murder. If you look at the opposite sex with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. It, 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 a lie is a sin. A thought of a lie is a sin. I'm just asking you, do, everything you're supposed to do and don't do, that's a sin. Everything you're not supposed to do and you do, it's a sin. Everything you think that's bad is a sin. How's your scale tipping? Right, how, exactly, what scale? That, the Bible doesn't present this. This is not true. Th this is what we were taught, though. But God is a God of justice. And sin, whether we think it's sin or not, bad whether we believe it's bad or not, will be judged by a just God. Are you with me on that? Has to be. He's just. And so he must judge sin. All right. The judgment of the believer... I said, erroneously, we believe that there's one day of judgment, the good and the bad, but there are many judgments in the Bible. Uh, the judgment of believers, Christians who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, our sin, we're, our sin is judged. The first aspect of that took place 2,000 years ago. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, the Apostle Paul says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. See, friends, the handwriting of ordinance, in other words, the, the law that we broke, the ordinance was the law of God that you and I broke, and the handwriting against us, a record is being kept in heaven for every one of us uh, and all of our sin and all of our uh, uh, transgressions. Uh, the breaking of the law and the ordinances of God are being written down in a book. And that book, friends, is a book that stands against us on the day of judgment. You with me so far? It's going to get better, church. Hang in there. What Paul tells us and the Bible tells us is that when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he took those handwritings uh, uh, of the ordinance or those laws that were recorded against us and he nailed them to the cross. In fact, he paid in full for those sins that were against us. Now I'm talking about the believer, I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. Those who have come to acknowledge Christ, our sin was nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. Our sin, every wicked, vile, stinking one of them, was dealt with at the cross when Jesus died. He nailed it to the cross, payment in full. At the cross, the sinner pleads, Hear me, church. Hear me, friend. If you're here, maybe you're a visitor, you're a guest here. Hear me, please. If you're just watching this, you're flipping channels and you're just, you came across this. Hear this, please. At the cross, the sinner pleads guilty, 
confessing sin and identifies himself with Jesus, his substitute and savior. First John 1 John 1.9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, if this, if this picture is you or was ever you, th then, then you're good. But if it wasn't, please understand. There has to be a place and a time when we acknowledge that we are sinners, that we are lost, that we have broken the law of God. There's a book being recorded, the handwriting of ordinance against us, and we're lost, hopelessly lost and helplessly lost. There's no scale to tip. There's no good works to pay. We're lost. The sinner kneels at the cross and acknowledges that we are lost desperately lost and in need of a savior. And we acknowledge that Christ died on the cross, taking our sin and nailing it to the cross. And we know that our sin was paid for in full. And so we repent. It means we turn away from that and we follow Christ. And the Bible tells us that he, when we repented of our sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness. Now, if you've never done that, it doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter if, if you're a member of the church. It doesn't matter that the pastor tells you you're okay because, you, because your name is written in the church register. It doesn't matter, friends, unless you have bowed physically or at least in your, in your heart, bowed before the cross and said, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I'm guilty before you. See, friends, we, we must acknowledge our guilt. And then we turn from it. And that we know then our sin has been nailed to the cross and it's paid in full. And guilt is removed. Are you with me? Amen. When we acknowledge, when the sinner kneels at the cross, he pleads guilty, confessing sin, identifies himself with Jesus who died in our place. Then he is faithful and just and forgives us of all our righteousness. Our sins nailed to the cross, paid in full, and the guilt is removed. Amen? Christ's righteousness is applied to our lives. We stand before him in filthy rags. The Bible tells us that our righteousness. You know, you ask anybody, are you a good person? 99.9% .9 of the people will say, yes, I am. They're walking in their own righteousness. They're clothed with their own righteousness. The Bible tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So we, we get up in the morning, we take a bath or shower, hopefully. Um, you put on the makeup, you put on, you fix your hair, you dress up nice, you're prim and proper, you come and you stand before God, you say, Lord, take a look at me. And we're standing before him. Our very best, our Sunday best is filthy rags. And, but when we come to Christ, our sin forgiven, and then he clothes us with his righteousness. He puts, us, put on, puts on us the robe of his righteousness, and he says, now that's a whole lot better. <laughs> and now we stand before him clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Our pardon is granted. Sin had to be dealt with. It had to be judged, but he took care of it for us. Having been judged at the cross, the faithful will not stand judgment relative to their salvation ever again. You understand that, friends? You'll never hear your sin again. It will never be brought up in your face again. You'll never have to give an account for your sin as it relates to salvation ever again. You will never be judged by God according to your, uh, by, uh, for your sin to determine if you're going to heaven or hell. That was settled at the cross. Done. Paid in full. You judged, your sin was judged at the cross. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is Jesus, ye, you, uh, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. If you've knelt at the cross, if you've knelt at the feet of Jesus and acknowledged your sin and acknowledged his forgiveness, friends, then you will, n you will not be condemned. You've passed from death unto life. First Thessalonians 5, 9, the apostle Paul says, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation 
by our Lord Jesus Christ. You, the church, you, child of God, who have acknowledged your sin. You didn't try and escape it. You didn't run. You didn't go to a church where they say, I'm okay, you're okay. You didn't try and dodge the issue. You faced it. And you said, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner in need of salvation. And I know that Christ died for me. You've passed from death into life. You're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And wrath, you are not appointed unto wrath. The wrath of God for your sin was dealt at the cross. And Jesus took 100% of the wrath of God. God's not mad at you. You hear me? Amen. God's not mad at you. Amen. He'll never be mad at you. You can't get him mad at you. Your sin and the wrath for your sin, Jesus took 100% 2,000 years ago. Now you're clothed with his righteousness and you're a child of God. And the second aspect of judgment, and please don't get hung up on this. I, I hesitated not even to put it in there because people, people are self-condemning. I, I caution you before I even go on. Don't be, you're not condemned. What did the Bible say? What did, you have passed from condemnation from death to life. There's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen? Okay. But this second aspect of judgment is continuing self-judgment. When I say that, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 31 and 32 Paul is cautioning the church at Corinth. I think Brother Ron is going to talk about it maybe tonight. The church at Corinth was out of order. And, uh, and they, they weren't living right, although they claimed to be living right. And Paul is cautioning them. This is regarding the Lord's Supper and, and their love feast. But he, he cautions them. He says, he says, check yourself out. Make sure that what you call Christianity, what you call faith, lines up with the word of God. Make sure that what you call uh, being saved is truly biblical, in essence, okay, to simplify things. He's saying, he's saying, examine yourself. He's saying, listen, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Are you still with me? What he's saying is, if we judge ourselves, in other words, Father, in it is, if, if this, is this action lining up with your will for me? Is this action lining up with your word? And, and we're judging ourselves according to God's word, then we're going to walk the straight and narrow. And if, so that we're not condemned. And if we are judged, Paul says, in other words, if God disciplines us, if we're out of line, then it's so that we... Because he's, he's correcting us and getting us back on course so that we won't be condemned. Do you, do you understand this? Paul's saying if we, if we judge ourselves, if we, if we check ourselves to make sure we're, we're walking according to the will of God, then we won't be condemned. We can't be condemned because condemnation has been dealt with at the cross. Do you follow me? So we're checking ourselves. And then he goes on to say this in 2 Corinthians Chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. That you're not going to be, oh man, you're not going to be in and out of the faith. And then in again. And then out again. You understand that? You're not going to be in and out and in and out of the faith. You are either in the faith or you're not. So you're, you're walking in faith and you find, and judging yourself, you say, wow, I really messed up. I, I stepped way out of line. I backslid big time. I, this, okay, well, then you correct your life and you get back. You, Lord, please forgive me. You move, you get back in line and you keep on going. You're, you're still in the faith. You follow me? Are you or are you not? Have you or have you not acknowledged Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you or have you not been born of the Spirit of God? Paul says, judge. so we're gonna, we judge ourselves. And if we're in the faith, then we just make sure that we stay walking according to the will of God. Amen? Amen. This is not self-condemnation where we beat ourselves up. You don't have to kneel on rice. 
You don't have to get out the whip and start beating yourself because you, you sinned. It, you, uh, it, don't be self-condemned. You're, you're, see, in view of what Jesus has done for you, in view of what he has said about you, and in view of the Holy Spirit being in you, you're not condemned. And you won't be condemned because you have passed from death into life. And there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? So I caution you on this self-judgment. It's just make sure you're walking right. That's all. It's just check yourself out. Okay? Any confusion on that? And then the third aspect of the Christian's judgment is that the judgment seat of Christ, it is referred to as the Bema of Christ, Romans chapter 14, 10. It's not a judgment of condemnation, but a judgment of rewards. When we stand before God, and we'll talk about this in a minute, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, your sin is not going to be the topic uh, or whether or not you make it. Right? Have we already settled that? That was dealt with at the cross. Your sin's not coming up in conversation to find out if you're going to make it or not. You have passed from death into life. You're a child of God. When we stand and when the church, when the Christian, the believer stands before the judgment seat of Christ, it is to receive rewards. It's to, that's the award ceremony. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we receive rewards. Can I just tell you what I believe on this? I believe when we come to Christ, we start out with everything. When we come to Christ and we acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior and we're forgiven of our sin and we're clothed with the, with the righteousness of Christ, all of heaven is ours. And then how we live as we walk, we <clears throat> either keep our rewards or we lose rewards along the way. Hear me. Listen to what the scriptures say. Uh, our works on earth determine what we keep. Second John, verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive full reward. It says in other places about losing rewards. You with me? So John is saying, be careful... How we live, he's talking to the believers, be careful how we live that we don't lose those things that are ours, uh, but that we, ref that we receive full reward. And I see it in other places in scripture, friends. Um, I, I believe when we get there, when we see, uh, we're going to be able to see what, what was ours, what could have been ours, uh, and, but depending on how we live this life, we're going to either retain rewards or we're going to lose some rewards, but it has nothing at all to do with salvation. And this will take place at the coming of Christ and the rapture. You still with me? I know I'm kind of I'm all over the place. Trust me, this, putting all these notes together, I didn't know which way I was going with this. There's so much to say. At the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Then shall every man have praise of God. Paul is saying, when he comes, when we stand before him, he will judge everything. He'll judge everything we said, did, thought, didn't do, should have done, and he will judge the counsels of our, of our heart. And then shall every man have praise of God. No judgment, no, no condemnation. This is, a, this is the reward for the believers. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. Paul writing, he talks about a trial by fire. Now this is to the church. This is to the church. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. This is our day of judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 
If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So when we stand before God, Christian, child of God, we've acknowledged our sin, we've repented before the Lord, we are, we've passed from death into life, we've lived our lives as best we could, judging ourselves along the way to make sure we're staying in the, in the will of God, and then the trump of God sounds and we're caught up and we're, and we're ushered before the bema, the judgment seat of Christ, and our lives are judged. Not for salvation, but our lives are judged. And all of those things that we have done in our lives for the kingdom of God, for the, for the sake of the kingdom of God, for Christ's sake, for the kingdom's sake, for the glory and honor of God, will be the fire of God's judgment. Friends, I believe the fire of God's judgment is the fire of God's being. Because he is perfectly holy and perfectly righteous and perfectly good. And, and, and all sin is, is consumed in his presence. So when we stand before him and our lives are presented before him, uh, the fire of God's righteousness is going to burn up everything in our lives that were done for ourselves. Even those things that we've done, even in the church. Even for the church. Even... Things that we did that were good things, but our hearts weren't right. We did it, and it was a good thing, but we did it to be seen. We did it, it was a good thing, but we did it because it was duty. Oh, those are the things that are wood, hay, and stubble, and those things are going to burn in the fire. But those things that were done out of a heart of love for God, love for the lost, love for the people, uh, tr truly for his honor and glory, when his fire meets those things, they're only going to get purified. Gold, silver, precious stones. And so that's the, that's the Christian's judgment. We'll stand before God, and our works will be judged by the fire of God's righteousness, and those things that were not done for his glory will be burned in the fire, and those things that were done for his glory will survive the fire. Not one of us is lost. Our lives are, are tried, and, uh, and, and we shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You with me? Okay, anybody confused? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's addressing the church. When he says we all must be, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, he's still speaking to the church. Each one of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. If what is built on the foundation of Christ Jesus is bad or worthless, he will be saved because salvation is by faith, not works. But his works will bring him no reward, or, or award, excuse me, or crown. And see first, uh, Second John, which we read above. Okay. Still there? Okay. You'll notice the highlighted area for your own perusal. The judgment of Israel, the judgment of the Gentile nations. These things are, this is happening during the tribulation period. I've given you some notes, I've given you some scriptures, and um, I encourage you to, for further study, you, you look at this. But for time's sake, I have chosen to leave that out. <laughs> All right. The judgment of the wicked. That's a terrible term, isn't it? It really is. I mean, there are some very good people that are wicked. Because it's not about our our moral goodness, well it is, but goodness in the Bible is moral perfection. And only God is good. Only God is morally perfect. Those who have not received the forgiveness of their sin because they haven't acknowledged their sinners, they haven't knelt before the cross of Christ and received the work that he has done as substitutionary for us, they're still being judged by the handwriting of ordinance that is being kept against them. And so those are the ones that the Bible calls wicked because they, we're all wicked, 
Only we have right, the righteousness of Christ applied. They do not. So the judgment of the wicked, and this is really the final judgment as it relates to the doctrine. It is called the great white throne judgment. I remember it this way. If you want to try and remember what, what's the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne of judgment. The judgment seat of Christ, Christ for Christians, and the great white throne without Christ, the judgment is great. So in Christ, it is the judgment seat of Christ. Without Christ, the judgment is great. Amen. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 15. I didn't put it in your notes, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn there. Ch uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 15. And when the thousand years are expired, this is after the millennial reign of Christ, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, together, uh, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works." And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Jesus will be the one who, is, who judges. He is the judge. Acts 17, 31. Because he hath appointed a day, God hath appointed a day, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained. That's Christ, that's Jesus, who came in the flesh and who lived a perfect, sinless life, is now the judge of all the world. And that day, uh, that, that day appointed, he will judge the world in righteousness. Romans chapter 14, verse 11, and Philippians 2, 10, both tell us that every knee shall bow. This is talking about the world. This is talking about the unrighteous. See, our knee has already bowed. We bowed at the cross. We acknowledge we are lost and in need of a Savior. We're saved. We're redeemed. But all of those stiff-necked, stiff-legged people who say, I am not bowing to no one. I don't need a God. I don't need a God now. I won't need a God then. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Those who did not have part in the first resurrection. 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. I know we discussed the, the, uh, the, the rapture of the church, but here it is. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the church, friends. Those who died in faith waiting for Jesus when the rapture, when the trump of God sounds, uh, the, the, the shout of the archangel, uh, the bridegroom cometh, then the, the church, the bride of Christ, will, will gather up and be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Those who were not ready, those who had, who had not acknowledged their sin and their need of a Savior will be left behind to face the tribulation and ultimately to face the final judgment. Those not living or having not lived in Christ or by faith are those who will stand before 
the great white throne. Are you still with me? All right. The books were opened and another book. The, the books versus another book. I said how, how Paul had said when we come to Christ, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. The, the book or the scrolls that were being kept on every person, every bad thought, every foul deed, everything we've ever done, the books are being kept. When we came to Christ, ours were nailed to the cross. Our handwriting, the handwriting of ordinances against us were blotted out, gone. What sin? But those who have not acknowledged Christ, those books are still kept. And those books are opened on that day of judgment when the wicked are judged, when the, at the great white throne judgment, and the books are opened. And another book. Here's the picture. I, I know I've illustrated this before, but there, there's, these are all the books. The, these are the books of the wicked dead. And another book. This is the book of life. This is the Lamb's book. In there is recorded all of the things that this guy ever did. In, in this book are all the things that this gal ever did or didn't do. All of those things are the books being kept. Those books are opened. And another book is opened. And this is the book of life. This is the Lamb's book of life. In here is recorded what the Lamb has done. He perfectly fulfilled the will of God. He perfectly obeyed the Father. He kept the truth in the Word. He died as the Lamb for the sins of the whole world. He is perfect and accepted before the Father. He has been risen from the dead, ascended on high, seats, seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the church. And when this book is opened, uh, all the names that are not found written here. You see, your name, my name, when we came to Christ, our book was nailed to the cross, paid in full, and our names were written in his book. There's no book. Your book, my book, gone. You can't find it in the Dewey Decimal System. It ain't there. So the books are opened. And then, and then the other book is opened. The Lamb's book. The book of life. And whoever was not found written here is judged out of there. See, if your name's written here, your judgment was done. Taken care of 2,000 years ago. But if your name is not in the Lamb's book, well then those people will be judged out of their book, according to their works. You follow me? According to their works. This is the final judgment. And no one there escapes. The Lamb's book of life, we are in his book because we came to him in faith. If a name is not found in his book, they are judged out of their own. Now we know in the scripture that there is a difference in severity of judgment. Don't just say sin is sin, because that's not true. If we don't know Christ, if a person does not know Christ, it doesn't matter what else they do. If they don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, they're going to hell. And in that respect, sin is sin. But there are degrees of sin and there are degrees of punishment. Just as there are degrees of reward, there are also degrees of punishment. I won't go into all the details, but the Word of God is pretty clear on that. Again, the portion of, that we're not going to go into, the judgment of fallen angels, um, it ends at the judgment in the lake of fire. I'm, I'll try and be done quickly. Um, I hate this slide. I hate this slide. I sat there as I put this together and I was looking at various slides and pictures and there, there's not a good one in there, friends. There's not a good one. When, when you talk about everlasting judgment, there, there's not a good picture. And, I, and I'm trying to be sensitive, but at the same time, this is final judgment. This is the reality that every soul on earth faces without Christ. And if you don't know Jesus, you need to hear this. And you, church, who know Jesus, this is what our loved ones uh, are, are awaiting. This is a serious thing. I hate this slide. But it's necessary. The final destinies. 
It's made very clear in Scripture, Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away. These are those who had not accepted Christ. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. John chapter 10, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We are in the Lord's hands when we've come to him in faith. And no one, no devil, no giant, no one can pluck us from his hand. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, Paul says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it says, obey the gospel. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The final destiny of the righteous. I'm sorry, this is this tiny little shack. Because if we could, there, there's no picture on earth that could even give a hint to what heaven holds. If this is truly a house in heaven, it's probably a doorstop. You follow me for the small... No. But to give us a picture here of the Father's house, compared to what the unrighteous suffer, we are in the Father's house. Jesus said... In my Father's house are many dwelling places. He said, I, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I've gone to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Here's, the, here's a Father's house. This is what awaits the, the children of God. 2 Corinthians 5.1, he talks about a house not made with hands, eternal. 1 Peter 1.4, he talks about an inheritance, incorruptible, in heaven, waiting for you. Those who've come to Christ, friends, this is our eternal destiny. <laughs> not this little hut. Not this little shack. Far greater than we could even comprehend. I know. I know time is going. I got permission. Final destiny of the unrighteous. The Bible uses the word hell. Um, when Jesus speaks of hell, he's speaking most often of Gehenna. Gehenna was the garbage and refuse dump and incinerator outside of the city walls. I was raised in Bridgeport. Uh, when I was coming up, we would go down to the dump, and the dump was always on fire. The dump would smolder. All the garbage and all the refuse that was put there, methane gases underneath, it would catch fire. And the dump would burn literally for weeks. It smoldered constantly underground. There was a horrendous smell as the dump was on fire always. There was... That was, a, that was Gehenna. There was a picture of a smoldering fire that burns. This was what Gehenna was. It was a refuse, a pit outside of the city. All the garbage, all the sewage, everything was brought to, to the valley of Hinnom where Gehenna was, and it was burning constantly. When Jesus spoke of hell, he always pointed to that. That was the image that he was, he was talking to them about. It will be like this. It will be like Gehenna, a fire that burns forever. <laughs> anyway, it smoldered day and night. And everyone was familiar with the sight. When Jesus spoke of Gehenna, everyone was familiar with the sight and everyone was familiar with the smell. When he talked about the everlasting burnings of hell, it was an illustration. Gehenna... The fire was an illustration. Mark chapter 9, verses 43 and 44. And if thy, Jesus said, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, Gehenna, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus wasn't saying, he wasn't teaching self-mutilation. He was saying, whatever you have to do, Make sure you don't wind up there in Gehenna where the fires burn constantly and there's no quenching. Revelation chapter 20 verse 14, we read it. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. 
This is the second death. Hell. There's several words um, from which it is translated. Are you okay with me going just a little bit longer here? There's several words used, uh, several words that are translated hell. Hebrew is Sheol. The Greek is Hades. Basically the same meaning. It's an intermediate state of departed spirits. It's not purgatory. Don't get confused here. Um, as you see here, this, is, this was when in Luke chapter 16, when, when, when the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus died, is carried into the bosom of Abraham. Angels come and carry him away. The rich man, he also died and was buried. That tells you a whole lot right there. But in, in the bosom of Abraham, uh, he, he's in paradise. This is where the saved are or were, and they're awaiting Christ. Uh, the, the rich man, he's in torment. These are the lost who never acknowledged God. They were dis disobedient to the law at the time, not believers in following God. And, and Jesus said, uh, or Abraham says, there's a great gulf fix between these two places, these two chambers. Now, uh, the, right, the rich man was in, in torment 2,000 years ago when Jesus told the story. The rich man is still in hell today, still in torment, and and ages to come will still be when the Hades or hell is thrown into the lake of fire. There's no, there's no plan B. There's no escape, all right? All right. Um, Gehenna, most often, as I said, was the refuse dump in the valley of Hinnom where fires burned unendingly. The wicked are kept in Hades until the final judgment, after which they are cast into the lake of fire after the millennial reign and the wicked are resurrected. When Jesus died on the cross, he opened up the bosom of Abraham. He took paradise with him into heaven. Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, 19 through 31. The rich men of Lazarus. Two compartments in Sheol. There is a great gulf fix between the two. Luke 23, 43. Jesus said to the thief on the cross who repented of his sin and acknowledged Jesus, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me. So uh, this compartment of Sheol, translated hell or grave, was taken up to be in paradise in, with the Father. And these unrighteous, the rich man and all those sins are still awaiting the final judgment. They're still in Sheol. They're still in this place of torment. Matthew 27, verses 52 for 53. When Jesus rose from the dead, it says that there are many saints who were raised and came out of the grave and were seen in the city. I don't know how that worked out. But when Jesus opened the gates of this place, all those that were awaiting rose from that place and ascended to be with the Lord in heaven. Are you with me so far? All right. The final condition of the wicked and the righteous. The final condition of the wicked. Separation from God. You know, we, we can't even compare. We, don't, we have no idea what that is. Because even the most rotten, wicked sinner still lives before God, They're, still lives in the presence of God, whether they acknowledge him or not. The total absence of the presence of God. When Jesus was on the cross and he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? It was the first time in eternity that Jesus felt the separation from the Father. And he cried out. Friends, separation from God for all eternity. Outer darkness. And there is a scripture verses just some of them. Outer darkness, total darkness. You're not, there's not going to be anything to see in hell, separated from God for eternity. Eternal, unquenchable fire, everlasting contempt, eternal torment, eternal punishment, everlasting destruction or perdition, ruin, where the worm dies not. Our, our bodies are loaded with parasites. And our, our lives, our antibodies fight them constantly. But when we die, the worm, uh, the, 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 uh, the parasites 
we, that's what decay is. They eat us al alive. <laughs> well, here in eternity, that worm, there will be constant deterioration, and yet the worm never dies. There's never an end to the decay. Uh, do you understand that? The wrath of God is there. Retribution. Uh, the Bible calls it the second death in all the scripture references that you can look at. Look, at, I'll, I'll be done in just a minute here, but listen to me. Because you've heard it. You may have said it. I don't know who you are. I don't know. But how many times have you said, well, if I wind up in hell, that's where all my friends will be. And we'll party there. Friends, there is no party in hell. The party ends in hell. In separation from God, in total darkness, in total torment, in suffering, without end. I, I, I've studied the scriptures. I see no party with my friends anywhere. Don't, don't take this lightly. Eternal state of the righteous. Our eternal state is life, 1 John 5, 11 through 12. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son of, uh, hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. This is not only eternal, this is not eternal existence, because every single person will exist somewhere forever. This is, we're talking about eternal death or eternal life. Uh, we could skip annihilationism and universalism are false, um, are, are false understandings. Eternal life is not just duration, but quality. You'll be living God's life forever. Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be uh, like him, for we shall see him as he is. Church, you and I, who have known Jesus, who know Jesus, will pass, we've passed from death into life. What awaits us is eternal glory in his presence in the Father's house forever. We're just going to move through those you you could look at those please at your at your own leisure but i'm concluding now one life one choice eternal life or eternal death and the choice is yours for those who acknowledge their sin and accept the gift of salvation through jesus christ our sin has been judged 2000 years ago nailed to the cross Paid in full, the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, blotted out, gone. For those who have not, their judgment still awaits them. The great white throne judgment. There'll be nothing about a party there. There'll be no plan B. There'll be no negotiation. There'll be no scales to balance. Moses said in Deuteronomy, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Here's the choice. Eternal life in Christ, our sin already judged at the cross, our names written in the Lamb's book of life, heaven awaiting us, or eternal death where we stand and give an account for everything we have ever done with no, no, no means of, of fixing that. Let me just quote something Tony Evans said. I was listening to the radio, and this I will be done with this. Tony Evans the other day, I, I was driving down the street, I was listening to him, Dr. Tony Evans from the Urban Alternative. He said, don't play a Russian roulette with eternity. He said, if you're a Christian... This is the only hell you will ever know. Amen. Say, life is hell. Well, no, not really. But if you're a child of God, this is, as worse as, this is as bad as it gets. If you're not a Christian, this is the only heaven you will ever know. It only gets worse. 
He said, as long as the wheel is turning, you have a choice. But once the wheel stops, all bets are off. As long as you're alive, drawing breath, it, it, where there's life, there's hope. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter where you are now, what you're doing, who you are. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter how bad you've ever been. It doesn't matter even what you're thinking about doing. As long as at this moment you acknowledge that you're lost and you need a Savior. And at this moment you kneel before the throne of grace and you confess your sin and you accept what Christ has done. The Bible says your sin, nailed to the cross, paid in full, book shut, done. All that awaits you now is eternal life. Amen. Never will you stand before God. Amen. Never will you ever have to question again if, uh, if you're going to see heaven or not. But if you haven't done that, friends, then the only thing that awaits you is the books that will be opened on that day of judgment. And you'll be judged according to all that you have ever done or didn't do. And there'll be no mediator. There's no one there to step in. He's there now. Jesus is here now to step in and mediate on your behalf. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. So I record this day against you. You've heard what I've said. Choose life or death, heaven or hell. The choice is yours. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. Lord, I thank you that you have not left us wandering. You've given us, Lord, the truth. You've showed us, Lord, what we must do. Lord, all we need to do is acknowledge what you have done. It's as simple as that, Lord. You just surrender our lives to you and receive the gift of eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that my name is written in your book. Thank you that my sins are blotted out. Thank you, Lord, that we, the church of Jesus Christ, are awaiting the return of our Savior to call us home into the Father's house. Lord, where we'll receive the rewards. Lord, all the things that you have given us the ability and strength to do. But for those, Lord, who are lost, those that are hearing me this morning that have never acknowledged that they are sinners, they've never repented, turned from their sin, they've never surrendered their life to you, God, I ask you now, Lord, as hard as it is to hear about judgment, Lord, it's, it's that hard to preach about judgment, knowing, Father, the final destiny of those who, who aren't right. I pray, God, that they've heard. I ask you, Lord, to move in their hearts right now and help them to see, Lord, in this, in this humble, broken, little presentation, Father, of, of heaven and hell. Lord, let, let one of the pictures, let one of the words, let one of the verses, let something grip them, Father, prick their hearts and show them that, that they need to get right with God. God now through Christ. Lord, I ask you to move by your Holy Spirit and to bring that conviction, to bring, Lord, the, the truth of the word of God to their hearts right now. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, we'll, I just want to keep you just one minute more. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a visitor. Maybe you, you, are, you just, I don't know, you're here for, for a reason, but you've never acknowledged Jesus as the Lord. Yes, you say he's God. Yes, you know he's the son of God. Yes, you, but but you've never acknowledged that you are a hopeless sinner like the rest of us. And you've, you've never asked that he would forgive you of your sin. You've never decided to turn from that life to walk in his, in his ways. This morning something is spoken to you and you, and you want to confess that, you're, that you need Jesus. I'm going to ask you right now, just raise your hand and let me pray with you. You're just saying... I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm confessing that I'm a sinner. I'm asking for forgiveness. I don't want to go into the lake of fire. I, I, I'm so grateful that God has taken my sin. I want to receive that. I want to accept that today. Is there anybody here? In church, then it's our responsibility, having heard this again, to do all that we can to rescue those around us that perish. There's no third choice. It's heaven or hell. They either are or they are not children of God. We have the truth. We have the responsibility to share, them, share and rescue them. Amen? Amen? Lord, I thank you today that, that we, the church, our names are written in your book and we're awaiting your return. Father, perhaps if somebody just stumbles by this or 
or somehow hears this, I pray, God, that you prick their hearts. I pray that you bring them to, the, to repentance, yes. that some soul would be saved, Father God. And Lord, we, the church, that we would take this responsibility and we would go out and win someone for Christ, that we would share this with someone for the sake of their eternal souls, and that your name will be glorified in this. And this we ask in your sovereign name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.